<laughs> and Nancy, can you just remind me um, how long you'd like me to talk for? As long as you would like. Oh, geez. <laughs> no okay. pressure. No pressure. Okay. Betty. Okay. All right. Well, let me just do the quick introduction. Okay. I'm Nancy, the IDTC program manager. There are a couple of newbies online, and I am thrilled to introduce Deb Watros, who is has a lot of experience raising service dogs. And she is going to discuss that experience with us. And we're, I'm very grateful that you were willing to do this. My pleasure. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? We sure can. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so what I thought I would do is um, I would just tell you a little bit how I got started, my experience thus far, some of the dogs I've worked with and where they are now. And then um, maybe we could um, see where the audience wants to go. Um, there's lots of directions that I can go after that. So, and um, it'd be great if this could be interactive. So if people have questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand um, or put it in the chat and I'll do my best to try to answer questions as we go. Does that sound good? Perfect. <clears throat> okay. All right. So it all started in 1990 <laughs> um, with my first mixed breed dog, Sienna. Um, she was like a, I don't even know what she was, Heinz 57, but kind of like a golden retriever, Irish setter looking dog. And um, I signed up for an Ithaca dog training club, beginner class, and uh, got my feet wet with uh, training dogs. And uh, Continued to train dogs, various breeds over the next 19 or so years. Um, played and dabbled in a little bit of everything, um, which was a great experience. Um, and then um, around, after I had shown for a while, it just got to be um, a huge time commitment and a huge investment and I decided to kind of scale back, but I loved training dogs. Um, I just loved working with the dogs, watching them learn. Um, and so I started to look around and, and I also always wanted to um, help in a service dog organization. So I started looking around. Um, started looking on the web and there's lots of, I don't know if you guys have ever gone to look at different service organizations, but there's a load of them out there. Um, and so I just kind of started looking around and I found, um, I wanted to raise a golden retriever um, as a service dog. And so when I was looking at the organizations, there was two different ones that I was looking at. One was Freedom Guide Dogs and one was uh, Guiding Eyes for the Blind. And the reason why I kind of steered towards Guiding Eyes for the Blind is because they actually had a region uh, club here. They had um, puppies in the region, they had weekly classes, it sounded like they had a lot of support. Um, and so I started volunteering, going to classes and helping out at classes and just kind of getting a feel for it. And then I took my, in order to get, um, in order to raise a puppy for Guiding Eyes for the Blind, you have to take a pre-puppy placement class, which is um, at that time, it was two full days. Um, and it was all um, what to expect when you get your puppy. They basically tried to talk me out of getting a puppy <laughs> um, because it is such a huge commitment. It's, it's really, it kind of kind of takes over your life. Um, and so I started that process in 2009 and um, I was matched with my first dog in 2010. So since 2010, I've raised five dogs for Guiding Eyes for the Blind. Um, three of them have been released two due to, due to medical um, issues and one uh, behavioral. And then um, I'm also currently raising one dog, a collie named Kismet for Blue Path, um, which is a different organization. Um, I'm also, geez, how long have I been doing this? Probably, probably the last four years I've been volunteering on the leadership team, which means either teaching classes, organizing, um, fundraising, uh, PR events, um, helping with the puppies, help answer questions. And then um, I became one of the region coordinators about three years ago. Um, and I co-lead that with um, another member. So yeah, so um, basically I help organize the, the region. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the dogs. 
So Karen was the first one. Um, when the puppies aren't named, um, they do it by the alphabet. So we don't have any say in what the puppy's name is. It comes named. And so um, Karen was my first pup. She was a golden retriever and um, she's a really sweet pup and uh, she loved blowing, everything blowing. So leaves, snow, um, loved water, loved her ball. Um, and so uh, I had her in program for probably a year and a half and she was starting to have medical issues. Um, she had a heart murmur and she was uh, intermittently lame in the rear end. And so they decided to release her. The other nice thing about guiding eyes for the blind, um, up until last year or the year before, the razor always got first priority adoption. Um, I think the rules have kind of changed now, um, but uh, so obviously, you know, after having a dog for 16, 18 months, 20 months, uh, you get pretty bonded. And um, so we decided to adopt her and she just became a great house pet. She loved nose work um, and she did some therapy work. So uh, that's Miss Karen. Next came fennel. Um, fennel actually came to me. I wasn't going to raise again for a little bit, um, but she sometimes what happens is a uh, raiser will commit to raising a dog and find out that it's too much work. Um, and so Miss Fennel was uh, given to, I believe she was either a high school or a college student. And after about a month and a half or two months, um, she realized that a full school schedule and a very high drive active puppy do not match, <laughs> do not mix very well. Um, so she needed to have a finishing razor and we volunteered to take her. Um, so uh, Miss Fennel was definitely high drive, high prey. Um, she also liked blowing leaves um, so much so that the day before we took her in for her in for training test at age I think she was 14 months when we took her back. Um, she went to chase a leaf across the road and dragged her handler into the road. <laughs> um, so she made it into training and she went through about five months um, and she was actually at her final blind um, test. And uh, they just decided that her prey drive was too much um, to safely guide a person. So. Uh, she did a career change and she became a bomb detection uh, dog for uh, the Michael Stapleton Agency. And um, she had a very, uh, um, a very, uh, what's the word I'm calling uh, that I'm looking for? A very good career, um, successful career. Um, and she led very, uh, a number of uh, top secret, um, I'm losing my words top secret missions overseas. Um, the problem, or not the problem, but one of the things that I, I didn't like so much is that once they leave Guiding Eyes and they go to another agency, they're not to committed to staying in touch with the previous razor. And so we lost touch on Fennel um, when she went to MSA. And so I didn't hear from her for about her in a very long time. And uh, I don't know, it must have been like mid career. Uh, I made a inquiry and luckily the handler at that time responded back and he was very, very kind and very informative and sent me lots of pictures and told me how wonderful she was. And um, the other thing that happens in MSA is they, um, change handlers and so they don't have a permanent handler and so she went through like three or four handlers um, and I just recently found out that she retired at the age of 10 um, and, is, and is now living with her last handler and I and the report is that she's healthy and happy so um, I just have to trust that that is true <laughs> um, so that's Miss Fennel the next dog that we got was uh, Feather she was a Golden Lab mix. She was actually Karen's half sister. Um, and that's why I got her um, because I wanted another dog from that, from that same lineage. Um, Feather almost was not in program. Um, at six weeks of age, she actually was attacking her litter mates. Um, and so they 
kept her and watched her and they kept her for like another month and uh, away from the other dog she showed a lot of promise and so they reached out to me knowing that I was an experienced handler and asked if I would give her a try and I said yes and um, so what we learned is uh, Feather can resource guard, resource guard around other animals and uh, when the pressure of work increases that tendency increases. And so um, she did not go into training and she was released into our care. So, um, and now she's happy being a sniffing dog. She loves her nose work. Fourth dog is Kobe. Kobe gets the most slides. <laughs> so Kobe, we finally had a success as a, as a guide dog. Um, this picture over here on the left-hand side of him laying upside down in his crate, this was Kobe for a year and a half. I could barely get him to walk. He didn't want to do anything. <laughs> and I didn't think he was going to make it. Nobody thought he was going to make it. And um, he went into training and he actually became the second uh, running dog. They started a running dog program um, in conjunction. And so these dogs actually have to navigate, have to um, direct their guide, their handler um, while running. So not only do they have to navigate everything like a normal guide dog would, but they also have to do it at high speed. Um, and so um, it was a, a big shock to know that he had that in him and actually enjoys running. Um, and so um, this slide kind of shows all of these, I've tried to put in some of the things that we do with, it, with them as we're puppy raising. So one is they have to ignore treats, drop treats. Um, and so we do the, the treat game. Um, we also get them dressed up. This picture is kind of cool. Um, you'll see that the it's kind of small, but the um, person who is handling Kobe is blindfolded. And so a lot of our classes will have the handlers um, wear a mask um, so that they can see what it feels like to be blind or not be able to see clearly. And then we'll have them do like recalls, off lead recalls. Um, we'll do dress the dog while you're blind. We'll have meals together. Um, and so it really helps the raisers kind of understand what the graduate is going to go through. Um, so those are some of the experiences. So Kobe did make it in for training and um, it was kind of fun because somebody actually was able to get some shots of him training at the guide school. Um, so one of the first things that they teach the dogs is to target the curb. And so every time they go to the curb, they have to stop with their front feet on the curb um, and wait for the signal to go ahead. This gives the graduate an opportunity to place their feet and know where they're stepping up or stepping down. Um, and then this uh, picture over here in the lower right hand corner, um, you'll see that he has a half harness on. Um, so he has the body harness, but he has a string on his back and that's because he was a little sensitive to the harness. And so they work with each dog individually um, until they're comfortable with the harness and the position and they can actually, um, change out the harness depending on uh, what the dog needs. Um, at the kennel where they're boarded while they're in training, they have all sorts of agility equipment, dog pools, everything, toys, bones, anything that they want. Um, and the dogs get let out for pup play twice a day. Um, Inside their kennel, they get those tent beds and they also have all sorts of toys that are either shoved in the, um, in the kennel bars or on strings. And this way um, the dogs can't um, resource guard over them. Like they can't take them and hide them. Um, they're there for all the dogs to work. Um, and the top picture here is um, the graduating class for Kobe. Um, and Kobe's here in the middle with his handler, Hannah. Um, and it's amazing that all of these dogs during graduation, I mean, sometimes there's some antics, but for the most part, the dogs can all lay next to each other quietly for the duration of the graduation. Um, and then this is Hannah and Kobe. So Hannah is legally deaf and blind. Um, she is also a triathlete and she runs three um, 
five K's with Kobe. Um, she doesn't run the marathons with Kobe, um, but she does run, uh, the five K's and she also, um, they allowed her, um, in her triathlon to swim with him. Um, and so that's kind of cool. So he has a very, very active life. Um, they go hiking, biking, running. I mean, she goes all over the place. She trained uh, for the Paralympics with him um, there with her. He travels all over the place. He's got the life of Riley. So um, pretty cool. And I love the shot with him coming near, near the camera. Um, so that was Kobe. Um, and also, um, I'm very excited. We actually get to go pick up Kobe this Friday. Um, his handler is going to Sweden for the month and unfortunately she can't take him with him with her. Um, so he's gonna come home for the month. So we're very excited to see him. Uh, number five is Orvis. Um, Orvis is actually half brothers with Kobe. Um, and we enjoyed Kobe so much. We decided to get another pup from the same mom. Um, and Kobe was in training for about, ooh, probably about the same time, about a year and a little bit, year and a half maybe. Um, and he came down with severe allergies, skin allergies. And so he was released. And so we adopted him. Um, and so um, he loves dock diving and um, he loves nose work. And he actually, this uh, picture up here in the right hand corner, uh, he participated in a Ooh, what's it called? A hemlock study, for lack of better words. But he actually helped <clears throat> them to prove a concept that if a dog wore a vest with seeds and walked, that he could disperse the seeds and they could potentially send dogs with vests into areas where people can't get to um, to help uh, continue the growth of hemlock trees. Um, and then this picture down here in the lower um, bottom is Orvis with a harness. And so you'll see it, I don't know, he's probably four or six weeks old here. Um, they've already started him getting him adjusted to wearing a harness. Um, and then number six, I switched gears <laughs> unexpectedly. <laughs> So Guiding Eyes um, used to, one of the career changes, uh, career change choices for dogs through Guiding Eyes was um, a program called uh, Healing Autism. And so two people that used to be with Blue, uh, with, that used to be with Guiding Eyes ran this alternative career and um, the dogs that did not make it for guide dog work could go into this career and become a service dog for a child with autism. And about six years ago, I think, um, Guiding Eyes decided to just focus on guide dog work. And so uh, the healing autism program got discontinued. And so those two people left Guiding Eyes and created their own organization called Blue Path and, is, and have continued that journey. Um, and so, when they split off, I actually just put my name in to volunteer, to possibly be a sitter or a raiser someday. And, um, and so this, this year they reached out and said, would you consider um, a short-term sit because there's a raiser that is set to have this puppy, but she's moving. And I said, yes, um, because I thought it was only gonna be a few weeks. A few weeks turned into like eight weeks. And, uh, the razor, the original razor decided it was just not a good time. And so and by that time, of course, I'm in love. <laughs> and so Kismet came into the house. And so um, he's in training currently. Um, and so we're trying to expose him to everything, um, everything possible, just give him different experiences. Um, this is this right hand corner is him being naughty. He uh, actually stuck his head in the garbage can and came out with the lid over his head. So, um, but he's getting used to grooming and being with children and being dressed up. Um, he recently got a CGC. Um, and, uh, the, and the difference between um, a lot of the commands are the same. Uh, for both organizations. I think the difference that I'm recognizing um, is Guiding Eyes uh, is raising a very independent working dog. Um, the dog actually has to make decisions 
on his own. And actually they teach them uh, what's called intelligent disobedience. So if there's a car coming and the handler says forward, the dog knows to say, nope, I'm not going forward because you're going to get killed. Um, and the difference with Kismet is he will actually be handled by a person that's visual and is actually like giving him commands and helping him. And so um, I find that Kismet, it's a little less drivey than the guiding eye dogs um, and is a little more uh, reliant on me. So that's just a little bit what I'm noticing so far. Um, and so now I think, does anybody have any questions? Um, and then we can kind of decide where you want to go from here. Kathy? How many dogs do you have? Uh, I have four living with me right now, including Kismet. So I have three of my own. <laughs> that's kind of my, um, we've had more, uh, but that's, that's, that's the comfortable limit. <laughs> and, and Deb, correct me if I'm wrong, three of those are either service dogs that for one reason or other left the program and kismet yeah so now it's two that have been released we lost right. cameron last year um and then i have a 50, almost 15 year old australian shepherd that is just my personal pet yeah right. so yeah. abby trying to find this abby says in general what percentage of the gb dogs get released before coming becoming seeing eye dogs and yeah so Oh, and the the, the follow-up to that is how many get released to other careers? Yep. Uh, so I have a slide, but I'm going to try to go by memory. Um, so what I remember is 50% of the dogs that are placed with razors go into in for training. And half of those make it to be a guide dog. So I would say quarter, hmm. right? Then that... I think that calculates out to a quarter of the dogs raised um, get to make it to guide dog work. Um, and I would say, I'm not sure exactly the percentage, we'll see if it says in one of the slides um, of how many go into alternate careers, but I feel like it's more and more. Um, they've really changed their training program to try to bring out the best in the dog. Um, and they work with the dog a lot longer than they used to. They used to have a very strict, um, timeline and if they weren't in final blindfold by four months of age they released them um, and now they're working with dogs up to six months um, and just giving them the extra time that they need um, and I actually I think one thing that's probably helped us uh, with COVID is that um, due to COVID, we actually had to stop bringing dogs in, obviously, and so dogs are older now when they go in. They're almost two years old, actually, when they go in for infra training, and so they're more mature and they're more ready to take on the work. Um, so I think we're actually seeing higher success rates now, um, which is kind of interesting. So did that answer the question? Yes, it did. And okay. that, that actually is fascinating to me because... A four month old, what you know, a four month old puppy is still very much a puppy, right? Whereas a two year old dog, yes, yeah, is stable and thoughtful. Relatively. Well, even, yeah, and even the difference between a 14 month old and yes. a two year old, <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's an enormous difference. So, that's interesting. It's yeah. also interesting that they've morphed their training to be more flexible and potentially place dogs with other programs rather than yeah. just release them for I assume to be somebody's pet yeah and they actually have multiple um alternative careers now um yeah. for just the labs um the German shepherds so we have a very well it's getting more we probably have I would say 85 percent labs and 15 percent German shepherds and unfortunately um, there's no other alternative career for German Shepherds. So if they don't make it as guide dogs, they all get released into adoption. But for the labs, um, they can go into MSA, so Michael Stapleton Agency. They can go into Connecticut State Police. Um, 
they can go into, there's another um, fairly new, there's actually two fairly new programs. Um, one is a, um, it's called like multi-facility multi therapy dog. And so the dog is assigned to a handler and the handler has specific facilities and the dog just goes and visits um, for like the day. And then the last one is, um, I'm actually not sure what it's called, but they actually adopt the dog out to a family with a blind child who potentially may want a full service guide dog later. And so it's just to help them get used to having a dog around, learning how to take care of them, but it's not, the dog isn't placed in that family to be a guide dog yet. It's just to get used to having the dog around. So interesting. Mark? Yeah, um, I'm interested in the autism, the blue path uh, work. I've heard that some autism dogs are taught to serve as anchors if they're working with a child who bolts and the dog just Yes. Oh. Sits down or lies down so the kid can't. Yeah. So off. there's, yeah. So there's actually, let me see. Um, I'll skip around. Oops. There we go. Uh, this one. So, yeah. So the interesting thing about Blue Path that I, I learned um, so, one, they teach the dog to anchor. So you'll see that they use a slightly different harness, it's a soft harness. The child is tethered to the dog and the um, oh. and the owner, the the parent <laughs> is holding the leash and controlling the dog. And you'll see that the the um, child can actually hold the handle. So the child becomes responsible for the dog, but is totally safe between being anchored and having the parent handle the dog. And so you are correct. Um, children with autism tend to bolt. And so the dogs are slowly taught that when there's pressure applied, the dog learns to lay down or sit in place and will not move um, and will keep that child from bolting. The other thing that they teach the dogs is uh, a term called visit. And they teach the dog to um, place their chin on the child's lap um, as a calming mechanism. Um, so those are the two big things that they actually teach the dog, amongst other things, depending depending on what the needs are for the family. Hmm. Kathy? Yeah, I was just wondering why um, there isn't placement, other placement for German Shepherds. I mean, is there a reason? I'm not sure of the exact reason. Um, I'm assuming... I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not and sure. Then, and then they only are doing labs or um, German Shepherds. They're not using Goldens or other dogs? No, my two dogs were the last Golden Litters. Oh. Um, they just decided that the, the Goldens were too soft and they bonded too closely to one person. It would not adapt to another handler well. And oh. so they didn't go through training very well. I think there's also, remember what I said about the um, intelligent uh, disobedience and the independence factor. I think the Goldens kind of look for permission a lot where the labs do it and then ask for forgiveness <laughs> if it's wrong. <laughs> That's kind of my, my comparison between the two breeds. <laughs> um, but the Goldens uh, work really well for the Blue Path. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or anything else that people want to hear about? I guess I could talk a little bit about volunteering. If you would. Okay. Um, so let me just go up. Do, do, do. So I'm going to talk about Guiding Eyes first. Um, so Guiding Eyes, um, so we're the Guiding Eyes for the Finger Lake region. Um, this is kind of how we're made up. We have one instructor or manager and then the two region coordinators, which I'm one of them. And then we have 10 leadership 
uh, team members who help, like I said, organize, run classes, puppy health. Um, we do one-on-ones, one-on-one uh, -on -one training with puppies. We do class training. Uh, we service the Cortland, Dryden, Ithaca, Binghamton, Elmira, like anywhere in that area. Um, right now we have 30 active raisers and about 90 plus puppy sitters and other volunteers. And our region is kind of unique in that we have a uh, campus club, so they're like satellites. And so we have guiding eyes at Ithaca, guiding eyes at Cornell and guiding eyes at the vet college. And so 90 plus of those puppy sitters are all students. Um, and I would say three quarters of our raisers our students, and I don't know how they manage a college curriculum and raising a puppy, but they do. Um, and we currently have about 18 puppies in training. Um, uh, we're a little low right now. We usually have 24 to 30. So um, that's a little bit about our region. And then, so we already kind of talked about the alternative career paths for the dogs. Um, so volunteer opportunities for guiding eyes. Um, you can certainly become a puppy sitter. So a puppy sitter is somebody who goes through the same training as a raiser, but um, it's kind of like the grandma or the aunt. So you can take the puppy whenever you want for however you want, and then you can give it back to the racer. <laughs> um, so it's kind of a nice way to get introduced. Um, although I have to say, I think it's sometimes harder to be a sitter because the dog has to learn to work with you. And so it's like a brand new experience. Every time you take a dog, you have to make that connection. You have to figure out how the dog clicks, uh, all the nuances um, and go through all of that. But if you just wanted to get a taste um, and you wanted to start out slow and see what it's like, um, you could become a puppy sitter. If you decide the puppy raising is for you, we can certainly do that. Um, the puppy comes to you around eight weeks of age, um, and you'll have it until 18, 24 months at this point. Um, and you would be responsible for everything from, uh, basic obedience, uh, taking it into different situations, different exposures that he or she might see when they're older, learning how to use those skills in different levels of distractions, um, the nice thing with guiding eyes is they pay for all the veterinary care. They provide the monthly heartworm preventative, flea preventative, preventative. Um, like I said, there's weekly classes, there's one-on-one, -on -one. they have experts that you can contact if you have questions, there's tons of support, um, there's the leadership team. So if you weren't up to having a puppy, um, either sitting or raising, if you wanted to volunteer in a different way, like help with organizing PR events, uh, you could help uh, teach classes. Um, you could be an assistant to classes. Uh, there's lots of different volunteer uh, web page. We could really use a um, social media expert. Um, we're really lacking in that area for Finger Lakes region right now. Um, so there's that. And then the brood stud foster in the home and early socialization for puppies, you have to be within a half hour of the, of the facility, which is in Yorktown Heights. So none of us would probably uh, meet that criteria, unfortunately. Um, so that's guiding eyes. Um, for Blue Path, um, Basically the same volunteer opportunities. You could raise a puppy, you could be a puppy sitter. Um, and then everything with an asterisk, again, you have to be within a half hour of the um, facility, which is uh, near Yorktown. It's actually in Hopewell Junction, I think it's called. Um, but you could also be a driver, um, which means picking up puppies from one facility and taking them to their puppy raisers or to back to um, the Blue Path. Uh, facility. So um, Blue Path also offers free veterinary care um, and the uh, monthly flea and heartworm. Um, the one thing different about Blue Path, um, they don't, because they're such a small organization um, and their puppies are spread all over the place, there's no local classes. And so everything is really done on my own. Um, and I think the only reason why 
I'm being so successful is because I've got the past uh, experience with guiding eyes for the blind and I've had all that support and I have all of my obedience and other training through Ithaca Dog Training Club and other things. Um, but I, I, I would imagine that potentially raising for Blue Path, if you'd never raised a dog before or trained a dog before, it may be fairly difficult. Neither organization requires any previous dog experience at all. <laughs> wow. So we get at all. So we get people who have never owned a dog, had a dog. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this is very informative. This is Susan. And uh, I had an experience when I was raising a collie and I got one of my collie puppies back. And a couple months later, I had a um, family that came and said they had a Down syndrome child. Mm. And did I have something that might be comforting to this dog uh, kid? And I said, well, I'll let you take this puppy. I didn't charge him or anything and see how it works out because he was not treated well. And for a very short time, only a week, um, was he gone for me and he's coming out of his shell and he's doing really well. And he's a very soft collie and he's a very loving collie. And so anyways, I said, why don't you take him? They were just here in Cortland. They weren't very far. Let's take him, see how he works, see if the kid likes him, all that. This kid had Down syndrome so bad, she, they, she couldn't speak. You know, it was just all garbly, whatever. So a week or so later, they said, well, you're going to be home. And I said, yes. Yeah, so how's the puppy working? She says, fantastic. Well, we'd like to come and show you. Aww. And because this dog had a bad experience with some other children and some other issues for just a week that it was gone for me, it was a very, very loving puppy. And there's the parent sitting in the front seat, the Down syndrome child and the collie on the other side. And they said, the collie doesn't care what the kid does. And the collie doesn't care uh what the kid says and they have their own communication because she couldn't speak she says it's been the best thing in the world for Aww. her so you know down syndrome is also another big big issue you know not only autism and all that but down syndrome you know has its own situations and i guess that kid was never going to be much more than about a three or four year old kid it, it was so yeah. severe Wow. So it was a really lovely story and that dog was meant to be yeah. and you know they would come by every so often and then there's they are dog sitting in the back seat with a kid with mom and dad in front <laughs> they said it was the nice. best thing in the world nice. so I was happy to do that and uh, so I find collies very forgiving very loving and I, I always love collies so as you know nice. I have one nice <laughs> yeah but that was a nice story i had to share it <laughs> yes thank you so kathy, oh I'm, I'm sorry i didn't know that kathy was up it's nancy do you take kismet to work with you i do yep so he's an office dog um and so he has to learn to settle in the office he right. has to learn to take on all the different noises. He goes to meetings with me and has to learn to settle next to me while I'm in a meeting, which he doesn't do so well. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a little impatient right now. <laughs> he just wants to move. Um, so um, yeah, he learns to ride the bus. Um, yep. He's doing agility class too. Yes, he's doing that to learn where his back end is. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, dancer never could figure that one out either. So I don't know if it's just collies in general, but yeah, kept falling off of things. <laughs> yeah. Kathy, did you have a question? Yeah, I did or something, but I've forgotten. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is very interesting. I thank you, Deb, for presenting it. And um, I, I think it's a great program. I'm glad you like to be involved in it. And you certainly have done an awful lot. And in the program and uh it's got some really pluses yeah yeah you know it's um it's definitely a service of love right um and uh 
boy, I sure do get attached to them while I have them. They bring us tons of joy. Um, I can't tell you how much uh, they light up our lives. And then uh, the bittersweet part is when they go back in for training and and go to their to their real purpose. Um, but you know, when I luckily um, I have the most experience with Kobe and Hannah, obviously. Um, and it's wonderful that she stays in touch with us, but all of the stories that she tells us and how much he improves her life and just gives her the confidence to move around um, is just, you know, there's nothing better than that. So uh, I'm happy to give back all of that love and joy that they give me. Hopefully they will do that in return to whoever they end up with. So, yep. I've done a lot of fostering for the Malinois Club, and it is hard to give them up. Yeah. And um, especially the longer you have them, the harder it's yeah. to give them up. Yeah. And uh, but to know that they get placed in a home that is really appreciative and they keep yeah. in touch with you, that is really you're doing a little bit more than what I do. I'm, I'm just getting the dog basic manners and, you know, get a good home. Yeah. But every breed needs some fostering and some help but in top of that you're giving back to somebody that really needs it yes yep yep so so it's hard it but is. great yeah thanks a lot i'm going to sign off all right thanks susan are there any other questions i can answer or anything else nancy that you want me to cover no that was i think you covered everything that was really super a lot of thank yous wonderful presentation thank you deb good work Everybody's enjoying this. Hannah says this has been really fun and educational. Interesting Aww. that some start out as guide dogs and end up very successful in other occupations. I don't know about Blue, Blue Path, but I have a friend whose daughter has a guide dog. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, and if anybody's interested in either coming and just visiting in class to see what class is like, you know, just let me know. We're we do it every Monday night in the atrium at the vet school. It's open to whoever wants to come. If you're interested in learning more about how you might be able to volunteer, I'm happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one and give you resources. Um, yeah, just reach out. Anybody else? Just thank you. And it was really interesting. Thank oh, you. good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Really, very interesting, and I'm I'm glad I had the brainwave to ask you because it's been something that I've been interested in. Good. So Good. everyone appreciates your time. Well, great. Well, thank you very much for let, letting me have the opportunity to share my experience. So, thanks a lot, Deb. Yeah, you're welcome.